Hello everyone and welcome to the NCUST Review, What Great Schools Do. This podcast is designed to inform educators, policymakers, and school communities about the research-based practices, policies, and procedures that make great urban schools, well, simply put, great. I'm your host, Dr. Deborah McLaren, Executive Coach for NCUST. Today, I'm thrilled to have as our guest, Dr. Joseph Johnson. Welcome, Dr. Johnson. Hello, it's a pleasure to be here. Well, Dr. Johnson, the first thing we would like to know is our listeners would like to know who you are, how you got involved in this, and give us a little bit of your background. Thanks. In 2005, it was my honor and privilege to be asked to come to San Diego State to start the National Center for Urban School Transformation. Before then, I served as a teacher, a school administrator, district administrator, state administrator, um, um, worked in many different capacities, um, often with a focus on identifying and studying schools that were achieving remarkable results for all populations of students. Well, I know I had the privilege of working under you as a student in the doc program for San Diego State, and I learned so much, especially what I needed to do with the APA uh, and <laughs> and all of the different things in terms of citing the research and how important that was. So thank you for adding to my learning during that time. So we're going to move on. What do great school leaders really need to know and do to meet the needs of diverse student populations and school communities? I think first and foremost, leaders need to know that it's possible. It's possible to create schools that achieve impressive results for all demographic groups of students. But it's also important to know that there isn't simply one thing that needs to be done. I think that oftentimes leaders might think that it's all about getting the right curriculum or it's all about a particular instructional intervention. But we've learned over the years that it requires a multi-pronged approach that starts with building a culture that truly is transformational, where all students and all personnel feel like this is a place where they are valued, where they are perceived as capable, and that becomes a foundation. But we also know that then rigorous curricula is so important that that students aren't going to learn more than they're taught. And so if we really want students to achieve great results, we have to make sure that we're providing a great curriculum. And then Ultimately, we have to provide instruction that's going to be effective and engaging in making sure that all students actually learn that rigorous, challenging curricula. I just want to interject here and say uh, something that's really resonating with me is that there is no one-size-fits-all. And I think uh, many times educators and uh, particularly teachers and school administrators are looking for a magic bullet, a magic pill, something that all of a sudden, if they find the right curriculum, it's going to meet the needs of every student. And I know in my own experience that that's just not the case. And there are so many resources that you can pull from, but the main thing is that it really is about what each student needs and identifying those needs and then making sure you have the right resources to use. One of the things I would say to um, teachers many times, I'd say, you know, I'm not going to ask a foot doctor to help me with my heart. So it was important for us to really look at the curriculum we were using meeting the needs. So thank you for that. Anything else that you want us to know about what school leaders really need to know? I'll just reinforce what you said, because so many times over the years, 
when we visit very successful schools, leaders will ask us, well, what curriculum did they use? Uh, what instructional approach did they use? And the truth is that in these very successful schools all over the country, elementary, middle, and high school, you can name the curriculum and we can probably find at least one of these very high-performing schools that was using it and using it well and using it effectively. But the other side of the coin is that we could also find a struggling school achieving minimal results using the same curriculum. And so what we've learned is that there isn't a silver bullet. The issue is how do leaders, how do educators use the tools they have intelligently, responsibly, creatively, in order to create an environment in which all students are likely to succeed. You know, I'm a, a visual learner, so when you say all students receive the tools they need, it makes me think of a hammer, a screwdriver, and a wrench. And if I need a hammer, a wrench isn't probably going to be the best tool. I might be able to figure out a way to use the wrench, but it's not the best tool. So thank you for pointing that out as well, that we need the right tools. So how do you believe if we have the right tools, transformation happens in our schools? And tell us about the research, because I know you've done a lot of research on this topic. It starts with leadership. Transformation does not occur in the absence of inspired and inspiring leaders, leaders who are able to establish a critical mass of stakeholders who get four things. One, that critical mass of stakeholders has to believe that the change that this leader is all about is worthwhile, is worthwhile for students. They have to perceive that it's not about complying with the leader. It's not, it's not about soothing the ego of this principal or this superintendent, that it's about doing what's right for kids. And so that's first. But then secondly, those stakeholders have to believe that what this leader wants what this leader is really going for, for all the populations of students they serve, that it's possible, that it can happen, that it can happen in their school. And, and creating that belief that the success is possible is essential. But then if the transformation is really going to happen, leaders have to get stakeholders to understand that they each have a few critical responsibilities. There's a few things that I need to know as a stakeholder, whether I'm an English teacher or a paraprofessional or a school counselor. I have to know that in order to make this vision come to life, there's a few critical things that I need to do that I need to be responsible for. And it can't be a list of 224 things. It's got to be just a few things that are clear to me, that make sense to me, and that I know that the success of our school depends on me being able to carry those things out on a daily basis. And then finally, when leaders are really successful in building that critical mass, because they're able to help educators as well as all the other stakeholders know that 
they've got abundant, high-quality support to help them succeed at meeting that leader's expectation. So often, we see situations where leaders have the right idea in mind, and they articulate what really is important for folks to do in order to have that vision achieved, but they leave individuals feeling like they've got to figure it out. And sometimes folks panic and they think, "Uh, I'm not sure if I can do that. And in the absence of that sense of efficacy that we can succeed, sometimes people get creative in a, in, a, in a way that doesn't serve children well. You know, you talked about vision, and uh, one of the things that I've shared with other leaders as I've worked with other leaders over the years is that it starts with me first having a personal vision. I cannot develop a shared vision and share something I don't have. I can't share a cookie with you if I don't have a cookie. So, we're... so I, I've said that because... Uh, I had the opportunity in 2007 of opening a brand new school, and in doing that, I spent a week or two, mind you, uh, at the beach at Malibu, of course, that's where I do my best thinking, but um, I spent time thinking about what is it that I saw, because a vision for me is what do I see as excellence? What does excellence look like and sound like? as far as an excellent education is concerned. So I did a lot of reading. I used books like Schools That Learn by Peter Senge and a lot of other resources to come to terms with what does excellence look like for me first? And then I had a greater opportunity to share my vision so that it became a shared vision because everybody wants excellence. And I tell them, you know, what I want when I walk into a school office is I want the Nordstrom experience not some of the other places the day after the holidays. Yes. So talk to us about some of the key findings since you said, you know, there are a core of things that you have to concentrate on, or as Covey, I think it's Covey that said, keep the main thing the main thing. What are those main things or key findings that NCUST has learned about what successful schools do? So I would say first, there is this continuous relentless focus on ambitious goals for every demographic group. Those hairy goals, as I've heard them called. <laughs> yeah. And it can't be something that's written on a piece of paper, put in a file cabinet, and forgotten. It's got to be the reason for being, the reason for coming to work in the morning. So when you started as a principal and you created this vision, you needed to think, how can I keep this vision on the front burner in my mind, but in everybody else's mind? And if we get close to a particular goal, you know, how do I get ready to celebrate that? How do I get others to see how their efforts are contributing and making a wonderful difference. But then how do we move up from there? So that is this always this goal focus. That's a key part, but it's not just progress toward the goal. It's progress toward building that culture that I talked about a little earlier that's going to ultimately help achieve the goal. How do, how do we make it such that all of our demographic groups are feeling like this is the place that cares so much about them and it's committed to their success? How do we create a culture in which every teacher, every support staff member is going to know that as a team, we've got such tremendous potential to make a difference for children. Um, And and how are we making it such that everybody knows uh, that when it comes to what is being taught, that there is truly what Marzano 
referred to as a guaranteed and viable curriculum. Parents don't have to get lucky by uh, having their child placed in the right sixth grade classroom because they know that it doesn't matter which sixth grade classroom their child is in, they're going to get access to rigorous, outstanding curricula, and they're going to get a quality of instruction that is going to engage their children and help ensure that their children succeed in learning that rigorous curricula. Well, I know that's uh, something that I want for my children and for my grandchildren. And I want to stop here because I want to put a plug in for two books that really reinforce what you're talking about. One of them is Leadership, uh, America's Best Urban Schools. And there were findings in the Leadership in America's Best Urban Schools that can help our school leaders understand what are those main things that they can focus on to really achieve the kind of results overall for their students. And then the other one for the teachers is teaching practices in America's best urban schools. And there's a lot of wonderful, wonderful learning there about what schools who've had success, what they do, what those main practices are. Anything else you want to tell us today uh, before we close this episode? Well, so those two books, as well as two other NCUS publications, uh, Five Practices for Improving the Success of Latino Students and When Black Students Excel. All four of those books, perhaps in slightly different ways, perhaps focused on some different populations, delve into all of the things that we've been talking about today. And... Um, and focus on what that culture has to be like, what instruction has to be like, what curriculum has to be like in order to make the kind of difference that we're capable of making as educators and as leaders. And, and, and so I think all four of these publications um, can be great tools for, for helping teachers, for helping principals and district leaders as they think about their vision for their schools and how to make that vision real for the students they serve. Well, it's such a pleasure talking with you, Dr. Johnson. I learned so much from you. Just for our listeners to know, the National Center for Urban Schools Transformation was founded in 2005 by Dr. Johnson to help districts and their partners transform schools into places where all students achieve academic proficiency, evidence of love of learning, and graduate well prepared to succeed in a post-secondary education, the workplace, and their communities. We will broadcast a new episode of this podcast at the beginning of each month. You can subscribe to our InCust review, What Great Schools Do, on Spotify. We want to thank you for listening to this episode of the InCust review, What Great Schools Do. Until next time, I'm your host, Dr. Deborah McLaren, for once again, the InCust review, What Great Schools Do.